Good morning and welcome to San Pedro Presbyterian Church. My name is Dave Reese and I am the Director of Faith Formation here. As you can see, things are a little bit different. Uh, we are actually doing a pre-recorded service, so this uh, sermon and different elements were recorded weeks ago. Pastor Paul was actually on a trip to take his daughter out to California to college and to visit some family out there. We also decided to give Mark and Kat and our worship team a break so that the music that you hear is actually from previous services and we've kind of edited them all together to make one cohesive service. And so since this is a pre-recorded service, uh, just I would encourage you to look towards emails and Facebook and other places to get some announcements about the life of our church and what are some things that are going on. One announcement that I have for you is that we are starting a two-week sermon series this week and next week through Psalm 131. It's a very special psalm to me. And starting in early September, we're going to be doing a special six-week series through this psalm. And so these next two weeks are kind of a, a way to launch those the ideas from that uh, psalm, and we want to encourage you to be a part of that. We're going to have a curriculum that's geared towards all ages, from children, youth, and adults. So we hope that you will find a way to connect with us during that psalm. As we gather together online, let's join our hearts in worship as we listen to the prelude. <laughs> to worship from Proverbs chapter 3. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. and Do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways know him and he will make your path straight. <laughs>
Please join me in the prayer of confession as adapted from Psalm 131. Lord, my heart is proud and my eyes are haughty. I do set my sights on things beyond me, things out of my control. Calm my heart, O God, quiet my soul. Like a baby at rest in their parents' arms, help me to be content in you. I wait in hope for you to rescue me, knowing that you walk beside me today and forever. Amen. join me in the assurance of faithfulness. Calm my heart, O God, quiet my soul within me. I place my hope in you, my rock and my salvation. Lord, I trust in you both now and always. Amen. <laughs>
As we sit in our homes, uh, many of us long for those good old days, those good old days pre-COVID, where we could go where we wanted, didn't have to wear masks, had a lot more freedom, it seemed. Uh, we look back at those times and think they were the promised land. Uh, we wish we could just get back to those days. But many of us forget that we were just running ragged those days, that we were moving from one thing to another, and life was just very hectic. I know for me, my life was crazy. At the start of 2020, I was feeling overwhelmed and on the verge of burnout. My life here at the church was just very busy. We had a hectic holiday season and those first two months uh, in 2020 were gonna be really busy. We had our youth barbecue fundraiser, followed by a youth retreat to Mo Ranch and then Youth Sunday. Each of those just requires a lot of work and planning and coordination on my part. And I was already feeling exhausted. On top of that, in January, I learned that my father had passed away. We had this estranged relationship and I hadn't really talked with him in years, but when I found out he passed away, I just felt compelled to take a few days and go back to Philadelphia just to spend some time with my family. I hadn't been home for 11 years, so it was about time just to, to visit and reconnect with some people. And I was about to uh, start my final class with Fuller Seminary in January as well. It was uh, been a student for over four and a half years, was enjoyed the experience, really enjoyed learning, but I was getting tired. It was really starting to wear down. And my final class required me to spend a few days out in Houston, which meant a few more days away from the family, a few more days doing other things. And so I was just feeling exhausted. And you know, with being in school for four and a half years, also during that time, our youngest son, Henry, was diagnosed with cancer. And so he'd been in and out of the hospital for two years. We'd just been going through treatment after treatment after treatment. And we finally got the all clear about a little over a year ago. And we've been just helping him grow and flourish as a young man. And so, but with all those things combined, I was just feeling numb and exhausted, spiritually and emotionally numb. I felt like a, a ship blown and tossed by the wind, going this way and that way, and never really settling down. I felt like I was going to go over and possibly drown. You know, like that story in the Bible where the disciples are in the boat? I felt the same way, like Jesus was on the boat with me, but he was asleep in the back, not really engaging with me, not really helping me out in life. At least I felt a disconnect there. So one day for my final class at Fuller, uh, part of it was to do this activity called a centering prayer. Now a centering prayer is where you meditate on a single word. You kind of spend some time praying about the single word and focusing on the single word. And I wasn't that excited about it, so I just kind of picked the most cliche word and I went with peace. I thought, well, we all could use a little peace. But as I was, thinking about it and praying about it and meditating on that word peace, I heard God speak to me a new word. I heard the word calm. I knew that I needed for God to calm my heart. In fact, there's a, a line from a psalm started coming to my mind, which says, I have calmed and quieted my soul. And so as I was sitting there praying about that phrase, calm and quiet my soul, I just felt God just speak to me. And so after I was done, praying, I opened up my Bible and discovered it was Psalm 131. And this is what Psalm 131 says. Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I do not get involved with things too great or too wondrous for me. Instead, I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, my soul is like a weaned child. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forever. God, we pray that you would just speak to us this morning. We pray that you would use the psalm to teach us to calm our hearts, to quiet our soul, to put our hope in you, and to trust in you now and forever. Amen. Psalm 131 
is part of the Psalms of Ascent, or also known as the Pilgrimage Psalms. They were a collection of 15 psalms from Psalm 120 to 134, and they were sung by the people of Israel as they journeyed to Jerusalem for the festivals of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Eugene Peterson refers to these collection of psalms as a dog-eared songbook. Uh, they are for the people of Jerusalem to worship God, or the people of Israel to sing as they ascend to Jerusalem to worship God. And, when, and he focused on these uh, psalms and rewrote them in his book called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And that experience is what motivated him and inspired him to develop the message translation. Because Psalm 131 is part of our, of our spiritual pilgrimage, and it moves us from a place of self-reliance to confident hope in Jesus. And for me, I've been pilgrimaging with this psalm for the past eight months. I've been meditating on it and praying about it and reading it, and every time I, I read it, I feel like something new jumps out. I've been picking it apart and letting God speak to me in unique ways. I've engaged with it with through art and with prayer. I've listened to music that was inspired by that psalm. And one day, I was out walking along with my wife, and we were talking about this journey I was on through the psalm. And I told her I was thinking about writing a book. And that's still kind of a long-range goal. I haven't gotten to that part yet. But then I decided to do something I was a bit more equipped to do. And I developed a six-week curriculum called Calm, Quiet, hope, trust. And I invited about eight to ten people from our congregation to join me as I fleshed out this curriculum. And it contained videos and group discussion, art and prayer and music and so much more. And this September I'm going to invite you to be a part of that pilgrimage with us. That we're going to have a six-week study that's going to be geared towards all ages of our church, from children, youth, and adults, and it will be starting around September 6th, and I really hope that you will engage with us and learn to love the psalm the way that I have. Because Psalm 131 is a journey of discovering who we are, how we are prideful and arrogant people, and also discovering who God is calling us to be, that we are called to be humble and content in Him. And it inspires us on how to live out our faith, full of hope and trust in the Lord. It invites us to join the journey of a daily act of surrender to, so we can calm our hearts, quiet our souls, hope in the Lord, and trust in Him now and always. As Charles Spurgeon said about this psalm, that it is one of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest to learn. It speaks of a young child, but it contains the experience of a man in Christ. Lowliness and humility are seen here in connection with a sanctified heart, a will subdued to the mind of God, and a hope looking to the Lord alone. So Psalm 131 begins with this, Lord, my heart is not proud, and my eyes are not haughty. And if you're like me, that kind of stops you dead in the tracks and says, wait, how in the world can I even... Uh, begin to claim this psalm on my own. I know for a fact that I am a proud person and my eyes are haughty. How in the world can I even study this psalm, let alone sing it and embrace it for my life? Where I found encouragement was from a 16th century theologian named Matthew Henry, who said uh, that some have made it an objection against singing the psalm, stating that there are many who cannot say, my heart is not proud and my eyes are not haughty. But we sing this psalm to teach and admonish ourselves and to become what we ought to be. So in other words, we sing this song not because of who we are, but who we want to become. It says, my heart is not proud. What is a proud heart? To have a proud heart means to have a high opinion of yourself. To consider yourself superior. One commentator says that it is an elevation of the heart, a raising of the eyebrows, a puffing of the cheeks, and a looking askance at everyone. Eugene Peterson 
suggests that uh, this means to be taking things into your own hands, being your own God, grabbing what is there while you can get it, improve yourself by whatever means you are able, trying to get ahead regardless of the price, and taking care of me first. Or my favorite theologian, her name is Dawn Reese, she says, a proud heart is someone who's thinking you're the smartest person in the room. And I would suggest that there are two main types of proud people. There's the overtly proud people, people who wear their superiority on the sleeves, people who walk into the room and think they know what's best, and they'll let everyone know it. They demand your attention and demand you do what they tell you to do. But then there are people, kind of like me sometimes, who have this false sense of humility, who respectfully listen and even allow people to have their way, but all while I'm quietly judging, thinking, I really know what's best and it's okay if they fail. Now, haughty eyes, it's not a uh, term that we use very often, haughty, but the, de the dictionary would define it as someone who is arrogantly superior. Or this commentator says that it's a person who has lofty thoughts of self, which breed ambition, worldly ambition, aiming at prominence and position. Here, Eugene Peterson talks about the difference between aspiration and ambition. You see, he says that ambition is aspiration gone crazy because aspiration or aspiration is having a goal and working towards it, while ambition is working towards a goal no matter the cost. As Peterson says, aspiration is the channeled creative energy that moves us to growth, while ambition takes these same energies for growth and development and uses them to make something tawdry and cheap. When I was thinking about this idea of aspiration versus ambition, my mind went to the movie Flash of Genius. Now, if you don't know this movie, it's about the person who designed the intermittent windshield wiper. Now, what is that, you ask? That's when your windshield wiper goes up, goes down, and pauses again, and goes up and goes down. So yes, of course, someone had to design that, and for some reason they decided to make a movie about that person. Mostly because uh, that person's design, his design for this intermittent windshield wiper was stolen from him. Someone from Big Auto came along and, and took his design and claimed it for themselves. And the movie shows that he spends the, a good portion of the next many years trying to get credit for the thing that he designed. And he worked tirelessly uh, trying to get that credit. Now the problem is that after years and years of seeking this, after going litigation after litigation, just so he could get the credit for his design, it ended up costing him his family. His wife left him, and he was uh, had a distant relationship with his children. So I often wonder if he looks back at this, and even though he got the credit he felt he deserved, was it really worth it? And the Proverbs, they help us understand the dangers of a proud heart and haughty eyes. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Haughty eyes and a proud heart, according to uh, Proverbs 21, 4, are the unplowed field of the wicked and produce sin. These Proverbs remind us that there's a danger of keeping our eyes on ourselves. And that when we cultivate a proud heart and haughty eyes, our lives are headed for sin and destruction. Now, the second part of verse 1 says, I do not get involved with things too great or too wondrous for me. For me, that's a person who's seeking information above their pay grade. They're a person who wants to have control over things that are beyond them where they demand answers to questions they don't have even have a right asking. And they work to manipulate systems in order to get their own way. Bernard Peterson, he says this, or Bernard Robinson, he says, when the psalmist says not to get involved with things too great or too wondrous, 
He's saying that we're not to seek self-promotion or glory. Greatness and the marvelous pertain to God more than mankind. For us to go about these normal divine activities is to aggregate divine attributes to oneself. So when we consider our ways, our thoughts, our um, opinions as equal with God, then we're promoting our way. We think our way is the only right way. And you see this all the time, especially on social media, where people are just haphazardly posting their opinions about things, finding a link and saying, oh, you should listen to this or read this article. And then they post their opinions about things like COVID, wearing masks, schools reopening, racial tensions, and they have this limited understanding, but they think that their way is superior. And they judge those who don't have the same opinion. It's like those people who are armchair quarterbacks. They sit at home and they yell at the TV, telling the player what they should have done to score the points and win the big game. Of course, they're not in the huddle. They're not playing the game. They're not seeing the opponent race down towards them. And so these people, they, they consider their perspective to be as equal with God. And those who don't follow them are foolish at best. Stephen Shoemaker, he says this, For the psalmist to say, I do not get involved with things too great or too wondrous for me. It is the admission to the end of human wisdom. It says knowledge alone cannot take us to God. And it recognizes what a mature faith must. That trust is deeper than knowledge, deeper than theology. Because Psalm 131 reminds us that choosing pride and arrogance uh, will never bring us peace or contentment. That we can only find true contentment when we surrender our high views of ourselves and we humble ourselves to God to find that calm and quiet soul. As Dave Guzik says, instead of proud pursuits, the psalmist is determined to find satisfaction and serenity of soul, content with God and his works. Now, the second verse of Psalm 131 starts out with this, Instead, I have calmed and quieted my soul. Once again, it feels like the psalmist is asking the impossible. First, we're supposed to surrender our pride and arrogance, no simple task. And then we're supposed to find a way to calm and quiet our souls. As Eugene Peterson says, that we are clamorous, uneasy, petulant people under afflictions, irritations, and disappointment. So there's no way on, under our own strength we could ever find a way to truly calm and quiet our soul. It feels like life is like a raging storm. We're out at sea and the storm surrounds us. The waves of responsibility are trying to capsize us. We're thrown from one responsibility to the other, from one demand on our schedule to the next. And it feels like we're going to go down. And even during this time of COVID, uh, it feels like we're going to go drown. This weight of uncertainty is like an anchor that's pulling us down. And sometimes it feels like the only way that we can find calm is in the arms of our friends at Netflix. And as Charles Spurgeon, he says this, uh, it's no easy thing uh, to quiet yourself. Sooner may a man calm the sea or rule the wind than calm themselves. So not only do we struggle with calming ourselves, that he says that it's equal to a person who can calm the sea or rule the wind. So there's really no chance that any of us could calm our hearts or quiet our souls. But then again, there was that one guy. One day after a busy, busy day of preaching and teaching and healing, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, Let, let's go to the other side of the lake. So they all climb into the boat and Jesus falls fast asleep. And this disciple starts sailing away to the other side. And while they're on the water, a great windstorm arises and waves are breaking over the side of the boat and the, disi the disciples are scared. 
Now, just so you're aware that several of these disciples are experienced fishermen. They probably spent their lives on the sea fishing, and they must have experienced storms of plenty. But there was something about this storm that was driving fear into their hearts. I heard one pastor say that perhaps this storm was the devil at work trying to do away with the Son of God. He saw Jesus asleep and thought this was his opportune moment. But then there's Jesus. Jesus was sleeping on the stern of the boat, sleeping on a cushion. He was asleep, content, trusting himself to the care of his Father. But eventually, the disciples had had enough. They, they needed all hands on deck. And they, they shout out to Jesus, Teacher, teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? To me, they're just saying, Jesus, we need your help. Grab a bucket. Pull your weight. We're going to go down. The disciples spoke out of their own pride and their own understanding. They believed that the only way to escape this chaos was to work harder, to bail more water, to, to keep going, wait out the storm so they could survive. But Jesus does the unexpected. He says that Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Silence, be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. The disciples' expectation of Jesus was different than the reality of Jesus. They expected Jesus just to help them make it through. But Jesus did something more. He offered them calm. You see, all of us face storms of life, and sometimes it feels like Jesus is asleep in the midst of our lives, but still, he is present. And sometimes we feel like shouting, Jesus, don't you care? And we try to manipulate Jesus to get him to do the things that we want. We want him just to simply offer a helping hand. But Jesus stays calm in the midst of the storm. Because he has power over the storms. And Jesus speaks, and the storm is silent. And there's a great calm. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus is going to silence all the storms of our lives, but he can speak to our hearts and to the storms inside of us and offer calm, quiet, hope, and trust. As I was uh, going through the psalm one day, I decided to lend my voice to those of the pilgrims and to take the words from the psalm and rewrite them into my own words. And so this is what I put down. Restless heart, don't be arrogant. Don't set your sights on things beyond you, things out of your control. Weary soul, don't get caught up in selfish ambition. The rat race, Striving for upward mobility, what you should do is calm your heart, be calm, and quiet your soul. Rest. Come to Jesus. Like a baby sleeping on their parents' lap, be at peace. Content. Place your faith firmly on God your Father. Trust in Him today, tomorrow, and always. So I want to invite you, invite you to embrace this psalm by confessing your pride and your arrogance and humbling yourself to the control of Jesus. Invite Jesus to calm the storm inside of you. Ask him to calm your heart and quiet your soul and place your hope in him. Trust in him both now and forever. Amen. And now let us proclaim our faith together by saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In January, I took a prayer retreat to John Knox Ranch, and while I was there, I developed this simple breathing prayer, and as I wandered around, I prayed this simple prayer, and I still use it to this day when I'm feeling stressed or burned out or trying to fall asleep, I return to these words, and it's a simple prayer of surrender. So the way it works is you breathe in and you ask God to calm your heart. You breathe out and you ask him to quiet your soul. You breathe in and you ask him for hope in the Lord. And you breathe out to trust in him now and always. So breathe in, calm my heart. Breathe out, quiet my soul. Breathe in, hope in the Lord. Breathe out, trust now and always. Calm my heart, quiet my soul. Hope in the Lord, trust now and always. Breathe with me, calm my heart, quiet my soul. Hope in the Lord, trust now and always. Breathe in calm, breathe out quiet. Breathe in hope, breathe out trust. Calm, quiet, hope, trust. Calm, quiet, hope, trust. Calm, Quiet, hope, trust, calm, quiet, hope, trust. So now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Receive now this benediction. May the love of God the Father, the grace of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship we have with the Holy Spirit lead us to a calm, quiet hope and trust. Amen. Amen.